going to start on my right, your left. With us is Tim Gogline. He's the Vice President of External Relations for Focus on the Family, and previously worked for Senator Dan Coats from Indiana. He also served as the Deputy Director of the Office of Public Liaison under President George W. Bush. And next to Tim is Melissa Rogers, a lawyer who's an expert in church-state relations and currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She served as the Director of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships under President Barack Obama. And on her left is Pete Weiner, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Polic Public Policy Center, and we all know him as an op-ed writer for the New York Times. He previously was head of the White House Office of Strategic Initiatives, also under President George W. Bush. And on my right, and I'm going to slip back a little so all of you can see him, is Jimmy Hawkins, a Presbyterian minister who is currently serving here in D.C. as the director of the Office of Public Witness for the Presbyterian Church of the USA. He was formerly a pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Durham, North Carolina. Please welcome our panelists. I'm actually going to start by asking each of, you to, each of you to comment on what you see as the causes of this really, really challenging partisan divide that we're currently experiencing. And particularly if you have a perspective from a Christian point of view about those sources of hyperpartisanship. And I, this one I really would like to ask each of you to respond to and who would ever like to go first. Well, since I'm sitting closest to the seat of power, I guess I will <laughs> go first. Um, I do think Senator Coons was um, absolutely correct in that we have allowed our political identity to be our dominant sense of identity. And I think that as Christians, and I really like the title, How Can Christians Deal With This Partisan Divide? My strongest sense is of, uh, of identity is as a Christian. And um, Bobby Bowden, the former coach of Florida State, um, Quasi preacher, been preaching since 53. When he won the national championship, they interviewed him about what was important in his life. He says, first, I am a Christian, then I am a family man, a father and a husband, um, and then I am a football coach. We need to have a sense of who we really are. Um, these political identities that we have are separating us to the point where even in churches, I hear clergy talking about, well, you know, I have a purple congregation, I have a red congregation, I have a blue congregation. We are Christians first and foremost, so I think, again, it's a misunderstanding of who we truly are. Thank you. Sure, I'll push it. Oops. Um, there you go. In terms of what's the cause of the partisan divide, um, I think there are, there are factors that, that are, um, have been in motion for a long time, and I think there are, th there are more recent factors. We've, becoming, we've been becoming a more partisan country for now decades, um, all, all of the um, polling research, Pew and, and elsewhere, shows that. Uh, and so Bill Clinton was the most polarizing when he was president. George W. Bush was the most polarizing when he was. President Obama more polarizing than he and now Donald Trump. Um, the reasons um, are several fold. One is that there is what social scientists call a big sort. The political parties used to have moderates in both sides. So if you were the Republican Party, even in the age, say, of Reagan in the 1980s, you had senators that were liberal Republicans, people like <clears throat> Charles Percy, Mark Hatfield, Bob Packwood, and Democrats had people like Joe Lieberman and Pat Moynihan. And that allowed some kind of, of um, cross-party work that had gone on. That has essentially disappeared now, and the, the sorting has gone on, and, and in the effect of that sorting is both parties have become more radicalized, or the more extremes have, have um, have taken control. Then you have geographic sorting. There's a huge divide now in terms of urban and rural. Um, social media has played, a, I think, an enormous role uh, in, in that. Um, the fracturing of the media back in the 60s, you had three major networks, and there was a kind of, you know, common town hall feel to it. The news came from the same sources. Today you don't, and if you are inclined to, you can find um, media outlets that will confirm every one of your biases 24 hours um, a day. 
And then to, to pick up on what Jimmy said and, and what um, Senator Coons talked about, um, there is what um, when Surgeon General, recent Surgeon General called a loneliness epidemic um, in America today. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a profound thing and it's a deeply complicated thing, but I do think that one of the effects of that is that parties, political parties, um, have become um, much more important a place of real kind of tribal community, as, as Senator Coons was talking about, and, um, and that has uh, contributed. Then um, I will say, and I'm just to get my cards on the table, I'm a lifelong Republican and conservative, um, but quite a strong critic of President Trump. And uh, I think, I don't think he has um, created polarization, but I think he has amplified it to a degree that we've, we've um, not, um, not seen before. Um, we'll, we can get into some ideas about, uh, about how to solve that. I think we can overcome it, but it's, it's not easy. And um, in terms of polarization, it's a difficult time. Yeah, um, just to pick up on what Pete said, I do think that you know, in President Trump and some others, we have seen politicians who, uh, for example, when they're elected president, their first thing to do is to try to think about how to unite everyone. And we've seen a trend instead lately toward, you know, a um, political tactic of dividing everybody right from the beginning and using those divisions, um, you know, sort of making, making us more bitter toward one another, encouraging bitterness toward each other, fear of one another, othering one another, so that you know there's not someone at the top of the structure who seems to have interest and incentive in bringing the party together. And as hard as it was under Bush or under Obama to do that, both those presidents really tried, both with their rhetoric and their actions, um, they tried to bridge that divide. I've seen, it seems like, some have abandoned that effort entirely. And then I think another factor of it is um, faith has been co-opted by politics in many senses. Um, certain, uh, certain factions, political factions, have learned how to uh, play certain religious notes that have really actually distorted the Christian message, Take plucked out an element or two and lifted those up as the only things that Christians should care about, and made, because that's what works well for the party. It doesn't work well for our Christian message and used, as I think uh, Senator Kuhn said, used weaponized scripture, used it as a sharp pick for us to go after one another, as opposed to something that should be you know, a, a message of compassion and love. And once we saw, and that's, that's been happening for a long time, but it's gotten worse. And um, so when we, as people of faith, have not pushed back on that and said, we're gonna reclaim the integrity of our faith, which, doesn't fit neatly, you know, under any particular political banner, um, then we end up with the situation we have now where even our churches can be highly fragmented and politicized. And of course, that makes it much more difficult for us to address the problem. The very thing that might help us solve the problem has been um, weakened over a period of decades. Tim. Sure. Well, a couple of things. First, um, I'm really struck, uh, in fact, more than struck, that when you uh, walk around Washington, D.C., one of the very first things that is unmistakable is the proximity of churches and synagogues to the seats of power. Uh, the focus on the family office is right across the street from the Supreme Court. And if you walk out of the back of the court building and you walk two blocks to the left, uh, you'll walk into a church. And if you walk out that same exit of the Supreme Court and you walk straight on A Street, you'll walk into three more churches. And if you turn right, you'll walk into, within three blocks, you'll walk into two more churches. Um, it's unmistakable. And I don't think it's an accident. Uh, you know, it's a religious republic. And this idea of faith and politics uh, go together in the American experience. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when the city was uh, being built in the way that it was conceived, 
uh, the idea of the centrality of the faith was very center, what was very central to what would become the national city. Similarly, when you uh, walk out, the, literally out of the front door of the White House, and uh, you walk across Lafayette Park, uh, the, the, the most prominent, and some would say the most beautiful structure, uh, is St. John's. Um, and uh, it's a place, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a, a beautiful place, but it's a vibrant place. Uh, during uh, President uh, George W. Bush's administration, um, it was a place that, that, um, that people uh, visited and went to a lot. And it played a very vital role, uh, you know, uh, sort of outside the, the, the normal lines of what people here would say would, would, would be power. Uh, of course, you walk three more blocks and you come to this beautiful place. Uh, uh, I, I think it would be wonderful if President Trump uh, would uh, leave the White House and come down to your parish uh, of a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. Uh, talk about civility and, and public life. Uh, I think it would be a wonderful forum. Um, and then there's Capitol Hill. Uh, not just out of the front door of the Capitol, but uh, looking over that beautiful and wide expanse of the mall, if you go literally four blocks in any direction, you will hit numerous churches and they're not storefront churches. They're not just establishment churches. They're, many of them are, are, are uh, churches that weren't even churches three and four years ago. Uh, one of the places uh, that I really enjoy going during the week um, is, a, is a church in Southeast that, that was a, a cigar store two years ago. So I think there is great hope. Uh, and I'm a hopefulist to the core. And I think that, uh, that, that Christians have a gigantic role and a historic role uh, to play in this time of division. So I'm gonna take where you took us in terms of the historical connection between church and state here in our country and follow that up a little bit because clearly there are deep theological differences in terms of church and state and we are struggling with some of those issues particularly around religious freedom right now. So clearly, Christians of different faiths or different denominations hold very different views on this. And given that we've opened up that topic, I would like to invite others of you to comment on that in whatever way you'd like. Well, one of the things I think we can think about um, helpfully in this space and in others is, you know, what are, what are the very fundamentals? You know, because we're gonna, Christians are gonna disagree about a lot of things, Americans are gonna disagree about a lot of things, but, I think we see a helpful movement to some degree in our civic life and to some degree in our life as religious people about what are those fundamental things that can unite us across our differences. And in religious freedom, for example, I think the most fundamental thing, or one of the most, is equal rights to religious freedom. Religious freedom for everyone, not just for people who believe like I do, not just for Christians, not just for a select body of Christians, for everybody, Mormons, Methodists, Muslims, Buddhists, Baha'is, everybody. So can we talk about that more in our Christian community? I frankly, as a, I'm a Baptist, and uh, Presbyterians don't have anything on us and the grape juice department and communion, I have to say. <laughs> but um, Baptists believe that religious freedom for all is not just a legal mandate from our treasured constitution. It's a theological mandate. God requires it because God wants people to respond voluntarily, not under the coercion of the state. Mm -hmm. So. Can we talk about this more in our churches about what it would look like for Christians to defend religious liberty for all people? Because I think part of the damage that we're seeing on these issues of religious freedom right now is that we hear uh, too often, and I should say in the Christian community too often, that it is a religious special pleading for Christians, mm -hmm. but turning mm -hmm. a blind eye to discrimination against Muslims or Native Americans or a selectivity where um, it's religious freedom of conscience from um, you know, certain laws 
but then um, not considering how maybe that would have to do with conscience about abortion or contraception, but what about the conscience of those who put out water for immigrants who cross the border? What about protection for them? If the policy preference doesn't line up with our own policy preferences, are we still willing to extend some protection for everybody's conscience rights? Or do we slam the door on people's conscience rights if their underlying policy claim does not agree with our own? So I think a, a great place to start on religious freedom, there are plenty of things to disagree about. Can we get this one thing right, that we're actually Christian groups are gonna go to bat for Muslims groups, Muslim groups for Christian groups? Are we gonna go to bat for each other on this or not? We ought to be able to unite around that. And I think we do, but we need to work on this right now. Uh, yeah, I'll say a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> Senator Coons, when he, he talks about the power of grace, um, and that is, in, in my uh, estimation, maybe the, the loveliest word in the English language. Um, and, um, and in my experience, it is the one thing that Christians have to offer the, the rest of the world, which, um, which nothing else does because everything in life, uh, virtually in our lives, um, are based on reciprocity and the, and the idea of grace. When people see um, the manifestation of grace, it has a way of reaching people in a way that I think nothing else does. Um, on that um, Emmanuel A&E church, what happened in Charleston, I have a good friend of mine, he's uh, Jewish, uh, atheist, and gay. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he's a very close friend. And, uh, when that shooting happened, um, I sent him a link um, to when um, the families went and confronted Dylan Roof a, f a few uh, days at the arraignment hearing um, after the killing. And you saw them extend grace through tears. Uh, and it was an unbelievably moving moment. And I sent him that link. And he wrote me back and he said, you know, I'm an atheist, uh, as you know. Uh, and I've never understood this concept of grace until I saw that. Um, Philip Yancey wrote a book uh, back in the 1990s, Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors, called What's So Amazing About Grace. And he said when he was doing that book that he would go around and he would talk to people in airports and elsewhere, people who are not necessarily believers, and he said, when I <clears throat> bring up Christianity, what's, what comes to your mind? And the thing that he heard most were culture war issues, abortion, gay rights, you, you, know, you know the litany. He said, not once did I hear anybody talk about grace. And he, and he talked about what a conflict that, what a cognitive dissonance that created, grace as being at the th kind of theological center of the Christian faith. And yet the world did not see that um, in, in Christians themselves. Um, and I just think that that is a huge issue until, uh, if, if you're talking very specifically about what Christians themselves, in their individual lives and in their public lives, manifest grace, um, then we're not going to get there. And I accept what Tim said. I certainly agree in large part with the history of Christianity um, and its importance. But right now, I would say, net, net, faith uh, is driving Americans apart, not together. And I think that contemporary Christians in public life, at least in the white evangelical movement, which I've been a part of for most of my life, um, is discrediting the faith. Um, so I think it would do a huge favor if we'd actually stop doing active harm, uh, and then we can begin to do good. And then I want to tell ta ta one other story, um, which is it's from C.S. Lewis, and since Surprised by Joy. And he's talking about uh, what he calls first friends and second friends. His first friend was Arthur Grieve, which was one of his childhood friends, and lifelong friend. And he said, the first friend is the friend that you, is your uh, alter ego. That's the person that you start the sentence, that person completes it. The person that uh, looks at the world like you do, shoulder to shoulder. And every, all of us need those kinds of first friends. And all of, all of us, if we're, if we're uh, uh, lucky, have it. Then he talks about what he called the second friends, and for him that was Owen Barfield, who was part of the Inklings. And he said, 
Uh, the second friend is the anti-self. That's the person that reads all the same books you do and draws all the wrong conclusions from them. <laughs> um, and and he, so he describes his relationship with Owen Barfield, and he says, you know, we would go at it hammer and tong late into the night with these debates and arguments. What was interesting is both Lewis and Barfield treasured their relationship precisely because they saw things from a different perspective. That is, they thought that together they would be able to perceive the truth better than they could apart. And they could do it because people had a different angle of vision on things. Um, and, and if Christians can model that, that is a big deal because I know from my own experience, I'm guessing all of you do too, it is so easy to see the partisanship and incivility on the other side. What's very, very difficult is to see it in your own side and to see it yourself. And you need people with standing in your life to be able um, to, to say that and to be able to say, you know, a kind of humility, epistemological and theological humility, which is, I can't see, none of us can see the truth by ourselves. We need other people who can help us to see it. Right. Jimmy. And, and I also, I'm going to echo a lot of what has already been said. Um, I do think we've gotten away from the faith of the Bible, and we've gotten away from the biblical Jesus. Um, Jesus has been redefined in our image, and, and I think that I'm really concerned whether American Christians are very acquainted with the Jesus of the Bible, his teachings about compassion, his teaching, he redefined who our neighbors were. Um, if Jesus were here now, the, the immigrants who are rushing the border, he would stand up for them. He would speak on their behalf um, because he challenged the Jews that the fellow Jew is not your neighbor, it's the one who's most unlike you who is your neighbor. So I'm really concerned that we know a lot about what our church believes, we, we know what we have been taught, but we really are not digging into the four gospels um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and what is the image of the divine that we get there? Also, we have this interesting syncretism in this country between Christianity, capitalism, and nationalism, and they have all merged into one, and so it's real fuzzy in our mind um, where what belongs to the church, what belongs to the nation, and, and we have really equated being a citizen of the kingdom with being a citizen of the state, and they are not equal alliances. Hmm. We are to be loyal to the kingdom first. And when there's a conflict between the kingdom and the state, we side with the kingdom. And so I'm real concerned that um, there's a lot, and you started out by asking us about separation of church and state. I think that the Christians have allowed the state to define the nature of the relationship. Um, theologically, there is no separation. We don't say we have our political sense of identity as Christians. We have our um, spiritual sense. We have our societal sense. They all are one. As a human being, I'm to be concerned about everything that goes on around me. If someone is being oppressed, if someone is impoverished, if someone is dying, if someone is hurting, if someone is feeling unloved, that I'm to care about them because God has done all of these things for me. And so I think we've got to get back to the basics. Um, in the close, Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? Love. The consistency in those three statements. Love your neighbor. Love God. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so I'm really, I think, we've got, again, we've got to understand that what I do when I go out to churches and talk to churches about advocacy, especially advocacy on a congressional level, I start with scripture. Um, talk about what's the, how does the, the Bible inform us about justice? You can't talk about the Bible and not talk about justice. Throughout the Bible, there are issues of justice. And so I close with the three images we get in the scriptures of Jesus. He was a preacher, a teacher, and a healer. And those are the three elements that we as Christians are called to be engaged in in every area of life. You want to say the three again once more? Yeah, preaching, teaching, and healing. For Presbyterians, we want to have an informed faith. Every denomination believes in Christian education. Preaching, that's the climax of our week. Um, then the, now the healing, I do challenge Christians. We generally limit healing to ministries of charity. 
you know, our outreach to the community, helping individuals who are impoverished, but advocacy also has to be a part of the healing ministry of the church as well. To change the system, because we do not have the resources to feed every hungry person in this country. When a person is not making a living wage, that is an issue for the church and for Christians. When people do not have health care, that's an issue for people of faith. Um, when people are uh, outside, every time I come to this church, I see men and women sitting on those benches. That's not just an issue with a, a problem in their individual life. Also, the system is broken. There is enough for all. So I'm going to go back to a minute for something that Melissa said. For years, we've understood the divisions between different parts of the Christian institutional. You referred very strongly to your own experience with the evangelicals for a period of time now. You mentioned that today, even within a given congregation, we have people who are no longer able to connect in the way that we've been speaking about. The organization I lead, the National Institute for Civil Discourse, as early as the Republican primaries in 2016, we began to get thousands of messages from people across the country. After the election, the number of those messages or calls that we got from pastors of Christian congregations, from rabbis of Jewish faith, some imams even, was, I've been leading this congregation for 30 years. We have been a complete community. And since the election, people won't sit next to each other. People don't come to our dinners anymore. So I want to take it down to that people-to-people -people level. What are the beliefs that we all hold as Christians that could become the opening the door between people in the same congregation who have really lost the ability to be open and receptive to one another? Peter, you, all, you already mentioned grace may be one of them. But let's have a conversation about how do I connect with that person that I've lost the relationship with in my own faith, in my own congregation? I might pick up on that very briefly. Um, I had the uh, privilege of hearing uh, Senator Kuhn speak two or three times. I think he's remarkably thoughtful, uh, maybe the most thoughtful member of the Senate. I mean, and I, I think his remarks tonight were, were absolutely terrific. Uh, I really, really absorbed what he was saying, and it was very, very well done. One of the things that I thought was most interesting, to your point, about his remarks, uh, when he said, uh, you know, but for the national prayer breakfast, he may not either, ever, ever come in contact with someone like Senator James Lankford, who he referred to as a really conservative, you know, evangelical. That to me is a very interesting observation on the part of a U.S. Senator. Uh, you know, even if you're from a small state like Delaware, there's a lot of evangelicals in Delaware, a lot. Um, he mentioned in his uh, remarks uh, three things that struck me. One, he talked about uh, the Norman Rockwell painting. He talked about football, briefly. Uh, and he talked about the Peanuts uh, Thanksgiving special and the Pilgrim story, right? I, I think the short answer to your to the point, uh, or, or one of them is this idea of worldview. Mm -hmm. There are multiple millions, right, of American evangelicals, uh, and in their worldview and in their concept of America, and I don't think they would refer to it as their Christianity or their faith. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to questions of, Norm, of of that famous Norman Rockwell painting and what it sort of evokes about America, or something as, uh, you know, as quotidian as Charles Schultz and the Thanksgiving uh, you know, special, right? Or football, right? It goes to the concept, back to your point, Jimmy, if I may, of nationhood, of identity, of a particular worldview. And I think it is quite possible as many others have said previously, and very eloquently, that it is one nation, but it's two cultures. And if you walk into any auditorium of two or 300 people tonight all around America, and you say to people, what, is, what does we the people mean? I think increasingly, uh, that is a very difficult question. What is it that actually 
what is it that, that, that actually unites us? Uh, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I'd say there are several aspects uh, to it just as it relates to the, to the faith community. The first thing is we just have to remind ourselves that um, our uh, political um, positions and our political uh, differences just aren't defining to who we are. Um, and when I'm talking about this, I'm, let me just say at the outset of this answer, I struggle with this as much as any, anybody else. Now, I understand, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I spent my life in politics. I have strong convictions about politics. I'm in it because I think that there are certain views and certain positions that matter more for justice and human flourishing. So I don't think politics is unimportant. Um, but we just have to remind each other that there are, some, there are different perspectives um, that people have. And to have differences of opinions doesn't mean that the other person has a character defect. And we're just more and more getting into that, partly because we, we don't really know each other. Um, it's just very difficult if you know people well uh, to do that, but if you know them from a distance, certainly if you know them only from television or from across the pew, then those things can be, be become um, uh, de defining. So, you know, I think both politics is extremely important because I think politics fundamentally is about justice. It's about other things, but it's about justice. But it's not the most important thing uh, in, in, um, in human life. Uh, the other thing is, I suspect part of it to, is that we're disconnected from each other and, and each other's lives. Um, I mean, I'll just give an illustration from, from my own. Um, I have stayed up several occasions until almost 3 a.m. talking to some people in my Bible study um, who are genuinely grieved at my position uh, toward uh, Donald Trump and toward evangelicals because I've been critical. I've tried to be careful in the criticisms, but they've been tough. Uh, and maybe, I've, maybe I haven't been careful enough, often enough. Um, and they care about that very much, and it genuinely troubles them. Um, but our relationship isn't gonna be severed. I've known these people f for decades, and they've walked with me through times of grief, um, and through times of challenge, and through times of joy. Uh, and so we have a difference in politics, which is real, and we talk about it, but it's in the context of a human relationship. And um, I don't think there's a shortcut to this. I just think if you have actual community, and you, and you care for each other, and you've walked a journey with other people, it's just a lot harder to demonize them. And if that doesn't happen, if we're fractured and separated, and back to this, lonely, then it's just a lot easier to, to, uh, to, to demonize uh, the other people. And just one other point, which is Jonathan Haidt, who's at NYU, is a great social scientist, moral psychologist. He did a book called The Righteous Mind. And one of the things he said that which has been helpful to me is he, in his research is he showed how liberals and conservatives have a different hierarchy of values. So for example, if you're a conservative, it may be tradition and order, and if you're a liberal, it may be equality and some other things. And when you understand that, um, that helps a lot. That is to say, I see they're coming at it with a different hierarchy. I think often what I fall into, what probably we fall into, is we assume other people share the same hierarchy of values. So when you and I have a fundamental disagreement, but we think we're starting from the same premises, we're just completely puzzled and, and, and uh, frustrated and flabbergasted by it. But if you say, okay, they see the world in a different way, not in a worse way, but just in a different way, that, that helps too. Couldn't agree more about the relationship building, and this isn't a congregational example, but it's one from Washington that I think has some transference, and that is um, when I started here in Washington, we worked, we had a coalition for the free exercise of religion, which was very diverse. Um, in fact, we got so, we got into heated arguments all the time, and a friend of mine from the LDS church used to sit around and say, and folks, that was just another little slice of heaven for us all to enjoy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we only agreed on a very limited number of things, but the, um, the coalition ended up uh, 
forming, we formed relationships through the Colette. We went out to eat. We met after work uh, to talk. We knew about each other's children. When they were born, people sent greetings, and you know, people knew when somebody died in the family. So I think that's the same kind of thing Senator Coons is talking about, that we're talking about. How do we make sure that we have to be very intentional about forming relationships with people who aren't just all on our side politically, or else that just crumbles, and we get in the situation we're in now, and perhaps even worse. So how can, can we set up, you know, single-issue coalitions or other ways of, um, you know, working together, getting to know one another as people? Um, and then I know the, the hierarchy, uh, seeing things differently, and, and your comment, um, of Tim, about the different world views, but and call me, maybe I'm, I may be too optimistic, but I do think, especially in Christian communities um, of different views, if there can be more discussion of, of fundamentals like the infinite and equal worth of every human being, we agree on that, don't we? We agree on that. Christians should agree on that. Um, truth telling, truth matters. Can we agree on that? So that ought to help us to, you know, just sort of trudging forward on some of these things. The rule of law is something I think we can all appreciate, a quality under law, a principled basis and approach to human rights policy, whether it's at home or abroad. I just think that there's a lot that we should be able to fuse ourselves better together around and then deal with some of the worst problems we have now while saving room for us to disagree about some of the more you know, nuanced issues. So I'm not always sure that in the Christian community, I think sometimes we get a little bit too wound around the axle about do we all agree exactly on immigration or tax policy or exactly how a jobs program should work? And, you know, right now, I think the better thing to do, those things are all we're talking about, and I have my own views, but can we start with some of these more bedrock things and say, if we believe in truth-telling, if we believe in the infinite and equal worth of every human being, what should we be standing against together, despite all our other disagreements? I'm not sure we've done enough work on that. And I don't want us to, you know, politics would have us say, well, we can't work with other people if they don't agree right. with us on the tax right. policy or every immigration plan. But I think Christians should be able to say, yeah, we, there's a lot of agreement there. Let's work on that. And I think having a sense of our own vulnerability, um, as Americans, we want to win. And it permeates everything that we do. And even in the church, when we want to be on the right side, but as Senator Coons has said, grace is the dominant word in our faith belief system. And therefore, we have to recognize that there are some things in which my opinions or I feel are right, but there are also some other areas where I'm wrong. And that goes for each person here. And I think that as we come before God, we, we make ourselves vulnerable. We ask God to open our heart. And then the problem comes when we have to demonstrate that with other people. <laughs> you know, it's fine when we're praying in our room, Lord, I've had a good day, but I'm going to meet people in a few minutes. I'm going to really need some help. But we've got to make ourselves vulnerable and to, and to not to get so defensive when we hear opinions with which we disagree. And, and we urge one another that if you're at a table, if you're at a session or a council or any type of committee and things get a little hot, take a break but come back to the table. Don't leave the table. And we have a, a, a habit of, we leave the table and we disagree. We don't want to be around those people. We even have pews. I know individuals who sit on this side of the pew because their arch enemy is sitting on that side. <laughs> you know, and, and that has no place in the church. And so I think as Americans, we've got to overcome that desire to win. And then also a biblical word that I think we have forgotten is hospitality. Mm. It's throughout yes. the Bible. We're called to demonstrate hospitality to each other, to the stranger and to those who are part of our family. And so I think it opens us to acknowledging that whoever enters comes by my door, that there's a place here for them. And that's what the church is to be. I love the open door policy that some churches have said, whoever comes into this place is welcome. Well, we know that's not true in many churches. If you don't look like me, if you, you have a different race, if you're gay, if you, you're transgender, if you're, if you're too poor. I've known churches where in, in Presbyterian churches, where a poor person walks in and people literally follow them around the church, mm -hmm. afraid they're going to steal something. 
And so this sense of being each other's neighbor in, in a sense of hospitality, and I do want to, Melissa, what you said, um, we focus too much on the areas in which we disagree. We give that way too much energy. If you have a list of 10 things, there are going to be two we disagree on, but there are going to be eight in which we agree. And I do not believe you cannot be a Christian and not be concerned about poverty. It's throughout scripture. We can argue, we can discuss about the strategies, how we're going to alleviate it, but we've got to agree that this is something we're called to alleviate. And as a person of color, I think that the issue of race in this country we as Christians should be able to have those hard conversations about what has happened in Washington, D.C. I was talking with Pastor Roger about how poor people are being priced out of living in D.C. now, all around our churches. That has to be our issue. And so again, this sense of vulnerability, this sense of hospitality, and to understand that we all stand here before the grace of God. Can you say uh, in just 30, 30 seconds? One is, uh, I have a friend who says, um, it's the difference uh, of um, listening to, to learn versus listening to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just very different things. So sometimes you hear from somebody and you're thinking, I'm going to respond to them to, rather than to learn. So that's one. The second thing is, and I agree with what Jimmy and Melissa said about, about common ground and areas of agreement. The, the one caution I would say is um, if in your mind the end game here is to find common ground, and a common view, you're largely, in most cases, not going to get there. Mm. And that's okay. I, I think what we have to do, what we're not doing so well, it, it's, it's less agreeing on a whole set of issues because we're not going to. We come from, we have different life experiences, mm. different predilections, different political orientations, a lot of things. I think what we're missing is how to live within those differences and how to navigate those differences because they're just going to exist. And they don't exist just politically. They exist theologically. They exist in every realm of, 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 of human life. And that, I think, as, as Christians, we have to think through what is it that we have to do and think and see when we understand that we are going to disagree on some, some issues, including some issues that evoke strong feelings in us. So I'll just add one thing, given what you just said, Pete. Our organization does a tremendous amount of work with people in community, sometimes in congregations, sometimes in neighborhoods. And the good news is Americans are really disturbed about all of this distance that has come between us and want to be connected. But the main skill that we teach, we call it listening to understand. Why did your life experience bring you to vote the way you voted? Why did my life experience bring you, my, me, to vote the way I voted? And then to reestablish a genuine curiosity in the other person's life experience. And it's amazing what happens when people listen at that level. Let me shift our, the entry point here for a minute. Given that we're in Washington, D.C., and given people in Washington, D.C., tend to be more focused in some ways, both on how Congress does and does not act and what is possible politically and what isn't, what do you see as some possible issues, real policy issues, where our shared Christianity, even though we have different political views, now might be a time that we could work on this policy issue together. Senator Coons mentioned one that clearly has been worked on for years and is coming to the foreground in Congress, which is some of the issues about criminal justice. But I'm just curious, from, given where you all sit and given how your lives have been entwined with public policy, are there issues where you see our shared Christianity might actually allow us to work on this issue despite some other differences in our politics. I, I might pick up on this. Um, Pete and I had, uh, we, we, we have a wonderful friend and we had a wonderful colleague in the Bush administration called John DiUlio, who sure. is a very highly regarded uh, sociologist and uh, political scientist um, at the University of Pennsylvania. So to be very practical, if I may, in the answer to your question, one of the most uh, remarkable things John ever did in his career, and he's done a lot of remarkable things, is to actually quantify 
uh, in the city of Philadelphia and in the metropolitan area of Philadelphia what the church actually contributes in social policy. In other words, with remarkable data sets and cross tabs, the question is, if you, praise God it wouldn't happen, but if you were to theoretically remove the role uh, of, uh, of the church in its provision of social services in a very large urban area like Philadelphia, what would be the actual cost, not just the human cost, but in pure dollars and cents, et cetera? It is so well done, it takes your breath away. And I think it would be a real start to have that kind of empirical study done in the, in the uh, uh, metropolitan area of Washington, D.C., maybe to include the contiguous counties in Northern Virginia and in Maryland. Uh, to Jimmy's point, if I may, um, I think that this would overlap enormously with several of the issues that, that you raised. Uh, I, I think uh, this, this, this parish is a very good example. Uh, just the number of souls who you touch on a daily or weekly basis, I mean, it's a very large number. And I think it would be better for us all to understand, just broadly speaking, what, what, what is, the, what is the, the, the sort of social capital uh, that churches, quite apart from government, and quite apart perhaps from other more secular non-for-profit groups, what is it that churches actually provide on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis? I think it would be an astonishingly high number. Very interesting. Uh, I'll uh, mention a couple of things. Um, the uh, global development um, and 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 uh, assistance. Um, I don't know if if uh, Republicans want to work on that. Um, for the life of me, I I do not know uh, why uh, churches, uh, including evangelical churches, do not make this front and center. Uh, one of the great achievements, maybe the greatest achievement of President Bush was the Global AIDS and, and Malaria Initiative. Uh, they've quantified how many lives that saved. It's roughly between 10 and 12 million lives, innocent lives have been saved. Um, and think about when was the last time you heard anybody uh, high ranking in a Christian in politics talk about that, celebrate it, uh, advance it, um, uh, to try and tell the story. This ought to be a layout. This should be relatively non-controversial, um, and yet we're not there. And 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 it. I think it probably says something because maybe there's something about the so-called culture war issues that draw people, that that attract attention and money and energy, and maybe it's actually not what the language says, which is caring for 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 the least uh, and 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 protecting. Uh, innocent life, but I think that would be one. A second, uh, you know, I would say Republicans and Democrats should sit down with uh, Francis Collins, uh, w one, of, one of the great people yeah. in American public life. He heads up the National Institutes of Health. He was the person who, who uh, sequenced the human genome uh, back in, in around 1999, 2000. Uh, and NIH is doing great work and alleviating tremendous suffering. And Francis himself, who's a Christian, and wrote a wonderful book called The Language of God. Um, I, that, I think, I'm gonna name a third one which probably surprised people, uh, but, but, I'll, but I'll throw it out there, which is pornography. Um, and I wanna hmm. tell you why I think it could work from a bipartisan perspective and why I think it matters. Um, I think from a liberal and progressive perspective, um, the objectification of women um, and the degradation of women uh, that happens in pornography is, is, is huge. And I think one of the great social movements of the last 50 years is the Me Too movement. And I wonder if there is an opportunity now on the left to say, this isn't good. Um, on the right, that's long been an issue. And the other thing, quite frankly, uh, people are uptight about talking about it, uh, pornography is a huge issue. Yeah. We are just in a different world. You know, uh, when I was a kid, yeah. yeah, there was the 7-Eleven, you know, wrapped up. You, it was hard to get pornography. Anybody who's a parent now, and you don't have to be a parent. I know pastors who have struggled with this. But I do know also with, with kids, this is harder than heck to try and stop. Um, and we know from the science now, from the brain science, 
of how damaging this stuff is, how it rewires the brain. And if you've got a fragile personality and, uh, and you combine that with the power of pornography, you have got potentially a lot of destruction that, that's there. Um, and um, so I, I wish people would take it more seriously um, than they do because it's always been a problem, but because of the nature of technology, I don't think it's ever been as much of one. And related, I think the issue of human trafficking, especially dealing with children, um, resonates with all of us. And I think that it's also, it's related to what you're saying, but it's also being downplayed. We oftentimes see it as an international issue, but the United States is one of the areas of concentrated human trafficking, especially in cities like Atlanta, um, and you start looking at gender issues and racial issues as well. I go back to the issue of poverty. I think that's a, a starter with everyone. Um, every congregation, I don't care what strife, um, is trying to alleviate poverty to some degree. And, and I think that's one we can work with. I also think we do have to, at times, target certain populations. Um, if you're talking about the black church, you talk about racism, that's gonna bring everyone together. Um, and, and I think that as we're talking to millennials, um, if we talk about transgender issue, issues, sexuality issues, that's going to bring groups together. I think if we're talking about evangelicals, we don't want to talk about spirituality, human values, family values, things along that line. I think some of us have to get out of our known issues and also look at some of these other issues as well in order to use them as a bridge to bring groups together. Thank you. Melissa? I think all these, uh, you know, the ideas that have been mentioned are definitely worth consideration. I know I just mentioned that um, in President Obama's administration, he um, created an advisory council on faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. And I think, Tim, you had some involvement with this. Um, but it was a very diverse group, um, including people from, you know, that voted, didn't vote for President Obama, uh, many different faiths other community leaders, and um, just yesterday we were uh, on an email list, all of the council members talking about a, a documentary film that came out today on human trafficking, um, child trafficking, yeah. very important, um, The Price of Free, I believe the name of it is. And that has just, you know, that unites not only people um, of different political perspectives, different religious perspectives, ideological perspectives, but young and old. You know, we really yeah. found that that issue resounded. And then the last council worked a lot on, on race, the problem of race, and um, criminal justice reforms, and a lot of ways in which voting rights, other things that just um, have really been terrible scourges for us in this society. And we were talking earlier about, I, think, I can't remember who said it, but the need to, to, I think Pete was saying it about the need to listen, to hear. And I just feel like the issue of race in America is so important for those of us who are white to listen. It takes a while to understand how bad and how, how um, you know, urgent this issue of race is, how deep it cuts. So, I just really hope, and I, I would love it if something like, you know, the Senate prayer breakfast or something, some group of that nature could, mm. could really begin to open some dialogues in the United States about our need as, as white people to listen to people of other races and their experience and their suffering um, and, and their leadership, what they have done to change America for the better. It's just really a, a deep issue that I think we, all of us would care about if we were open, opened up our hearts and our minds to it. One caveat, if I may. Um, Melissa's uh, terrific colleague at Brookings, Bell Sawhill, has a new book um, which focuses like a laser beam on young people. Bob Putman, uh, his, his great study. Uh, Charles Murray, Nick Eberstadt. Uh, you know, the idea of, of left and right uh, the idea of evangelicals, Catholics, et cetera, et cetera, coming together on this issue of focusing like a laser beam on young people and, 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 and what is happening mm -hmm. among this rising generation of young people, uh, you know, under a, the age of 18. It's really stunning. And I think that there are great scholars left and right, some Christians, some not. They have actually quite remarkable things to say about this, and I think this is something 
uh, where, where the Christian community, broadly defined, could absolutely, re could, could absolutely unite. Great. If I could just add as a closing. And I think we've got to strike while the iron is hot. Um, right now, we are at a pivotal point where there might be some criminal justice reform. Um, where there's a bipartisan bill, that's, the president has said that it looks good to him. And we've got to send in letters, we've got to endorse that, and really encourage members of Congress to get behind this. Um, Lamar Alexander, Republican, and Patty Mary, a Democrat, um, for the last two years have been trying to prop up the ACA by getting insurance companies to. We've got to encourage that. Time. When we do see evidence of some bipartisan, bipartisanism working together across party lines, we've got to encourage that, not just, you know, feel distraught when things are not working out, but when things are really at a point where in the American public needs to speak, we are the voice that needs to be heard. Great. So I think we all know that we were gifted to hear Senator Coons this evening. And there was one other important message in his talk that we haven't uh, mentioned, and that was the quality of humility the quality of actually recognizing that it's a lot easier for me to see the moat in your eye than to recognize the one in mine. And in a few minutes, Theo is going to invite this entire congregation to really think deeply about what each of you, what each of us might do after this evening to take a step toward reestablishing the social norms of civility and respect and what we learned at our mother's and father's knees about how we want to be treated. So I'm actually going to ask each of us to just reflect for a moment. And out of the way this evening's experience has washed, washed over each of us, and I'll do it as well, to actually publicly declare what are, am I going to do as a result of this evening to further my modeling of the world we need to be back into past this horrendous partisan divide. Fair enough? We'll start with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I'll tell you, um, what once a week, uh, I have um, about 700 colleagues that focus on the family, and we are uh, in, in, involved in one way or the other in about 138 countries around the world. Uh, and this is, you know, broadly defined. Um, but uh, each week I'm asked to contribute a few paragraphs uh, about the previous week. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, because it's focused, it's read by a lot of people. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share with my colleagues, uh, I, I hope, a fairly uh, deep dive reflection on tonight to, uh, to reflect into the focus on the family bloodstream uh, and into our own sort of institutional DNA uh, some of the great observations that I've heard tonight, and I will be very eager to hear from um, colleagues domestically and globally uh, what, what their take is. Uh, it particularly struck me, if I may say, on the question um, of trafficking. Uh, we're in the same state, and you wouldn't think that we're you know, close, but the Gill Foundation and Focus on the Family are divided by just a few miles on I-25. Uh, and we found that we had one of the worst in Colorado, one of the absolute worst trafficking uh, corridors in the United States. And Focus on the Family joined with the Gill Foundation uh, in the Colorado legislature. Uh, we agreed to disagree on some things, but we found a way to work together to draft one of the best anti-exploitation uh, 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 bills in the United States. Uh, and, it, and it passed and was signed into law. Uh, and I think it's fair to say with humility, if focus on the family and the Gill Foundation can work together in this regard, hope springs eternal. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, mine's gonna be probably more boring and more granular than, than Tim's, but, uh, but that be that as it may. Um, let me submit, make a point about uh, reconciliation and encouragement. Um, on the point of reconciliation, uh, first the story. Um, the, uh, there's a journalist, a, fr a friend of mine, I was close friends with him, Joe Klein. Uh, the, I knew Joe um, through the 1990s. We were somewhat uh, different uh, politically. He was center left, I was center right. But Joe is a great company and, and, and we really got to know each other. And we actually, I think the first time we, we met was 
uh, on issues of uh, so, uh, faith-based uh, social programs and their effectiveness. And then I went into the Bush administration and Joe uh, and I uh, got into, uh, di there were some differences. Uh, they were focused primarily on the Iraq war. Uh, to make a long story short, so when I, Joe was critical of me, I responded uh, and we ended up having a very kind of public debate uh, where we uh, really um, went after each other. And I justified uh, my, uh, my responses by saying, uh, you know, I think he, my perspective, he threw the first punch, you've got to defend yourself, I've got a case to make, I'm going to do it. But I never really felt that comfortable uh, about it. And the people who knew me best, like my wife Cindy, knew um, that that wasn't really quite right and that wasn't going to settle well with me. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an email to Joe, uh, and I said, uh, uh, I wonder if we can get together. Um, and I sort of named it, what, you know, what had been going on. Um, and we had a very nice email exchange. It was actually very personal uh, in, in a good way. Uh, and so we decided to meet at the Jefferson Hotel for, uh, for lunch. And so we were walking there, and we saw each other. He came, he came across the street, and we just embraced. We didn't even say anything. And we had a lovely lunch, and, uh, and we reconciled. Um, it took us a long time to do it. Um, it took years before... Uh, before that was, and I'm not sure that if I or he had reached out before, maybe it wouldn't have worked. So the timing has to be right. And I was thinking actually just two days ago, um, are there people in my life, and there was one person in particular that I thought, do I need to reconcile with? Is there something relationally that is not right? Um, and, uh, and what can I do to repair that? Um, and it's one thing to identify it, it's the second thing to actually do it. Um, so next time I'm here, you can check. Um, the other one is, uh, just apropos of what I was saying, I've had exchanges with some people, which I do often, who are Trump supporters, and, um, and I make my case and they make theirs, and they're okay, I don't wanna overstate it, I, I try and be careful, but I'm also aware that um, that, they, that can strain things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so it strikes me that one of the things that can happen is then to be in contact with those people in a completely non-political way um, that actually shows in genuine interest in their life. Um, because if it's just back and forth and back and forth on politics, uh, like I'm really no better than you do, you know, at some point that just becomes a bit, um, a bit, uh, a bit much. So, uh, to try and see that relationship in that context is, is one that I hope I, I follow up on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, one of the things I've been thinking about, I've been working in the past year on a book, which I'll finally, I hope, get the manuscript off before the end of the year. So I've had to be a bit of a hermit. So I have yet to really do my post White House, you know, reintroductions to people. And like Pete, you know, there were there were great times in the White House and then there were times that were tough with with folks. And so um, some of those I, I think none of the relationships have been ruptured that were there were tough interactions, but those are things that there are a lot of people that I like a lot who, you know, were on the other side and on issues and I'd like to get re you know, to reestablish the relationship. And I'd also like and you guys, I guess I'll by saying this you can keep me honest, um, I'd like to spend, you know, for every time I'm on any form of social media to have a real life interaction with people that will at least be the equal, if not, you know, many more times and do less of the social media and more of the in-person lunches, mm -hmm. telephone calls, meetings um, and conversations because I, I for one find that social media isn't helping a lot with uh, breaking through some of these problems, at least on my own behalf. And then I'll just close by giving, you talked about humility, so my favorite quote is uh, Barbara Jordan, mm -hmm. who said, um, and I, I wish I had the Barbara Jordan voice, but I don't, mm -hmm. but she said, uh, I won't get it just right, but she said, you would do well to remember 
remember, and she was speaking to a group of Christians, she said, that, you are, that we are God's servants, not God's spokespeople. Ooh. And God Ooh. may have uh, not revealed to you what he, what he has revealed to someone else, so you may need to listen. <laughs> I won't get it all right, but I know the part about ser- being God's servants and not God's spokespeople is right and certainly something that uh, I, I need to remember more in my daily life. And I think in closing, um, to get out of my comfort zone, I mean, to be honest with you, this is a very safe place here to have this conversation, um, to go into some unsafe places, um, to go, especially I think with people who are enduring the harshness of life in America today. Um, is that a clue? <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, God has said, it's time to go. <laughs> but I think oftentimes we have these conversations with each other. And we need to have these conversations with people who need to be a part of these conversations because there are a lot of perspectives out there that are not being heard in this context. Thank you all very, very much. How about a round of applause for an extraordinary evening?